Okay, well, thank you everybody. I'm Lena Sun. I'm a health reporter for the Washington Post. Our last panel for today, esteemed guests, are, uh, are going to focus on public health in America. So joining me on stage to my left, Dr. Regina Benjamin. She's the founder and CEO of the Bio La Batre Rural Health Care Clinic. But in 2009, Dr. Benjamin was appointed by President Obama as the 18th Surgeon General of the United States, and she served in that position until 2013. To her left, Dr. Richard Besser is the president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a position he assumed earlier this year. And doctors, Dr. Besser's former titles included acting director of the CDC and ABC News chief health and medical editor. And to my left, all the way, is Dr. Sandeep Jahar, a practicing cardiologist and a best-selling author. He is also a New York Times contrib contributing opinion writer covering health, medicine, aging, and ethics. Thank you all for joining us today. I want to remind folks in the audience and those watching at home that you can tweet your questions using the hashtag transformers. You can also leave them in the comments section of the Facebook live stream um, that's uh, on. So let's begin. Um, I was wondering if the three of you could each spend a few minutes describing for us as we look forward into the next 20 years, what are the biggest public health threats that you see and what are some possible solutions? And to keep your answers to five minutes, Dr. Benjamin, would you like to start? Sure, I told Richard he could start. Well, could start. well one of you, whoever wants to start can yeah, jump I'm, in. I'm, I'm happy to kick off. Um, Thanks, thanks very much for, for having this panel. I, I think uh, having a discussion of public health mixed in with the discussions around technology is, is, is important. When, when I think about the challenges we face in, in, in public health and as we face in a world, there, there are these, these big threats of things that can, can destroy populations, uh, epidemics, uh, massive uh, natural disasters like we're seeing. Um, but then I, th I think about what, what we face every day, and it's the, it's the everyday problems uh, that I think are, are critically important for us to face as a society. Um, at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we're focused very much on what it takes for everybody in, in this country to have a fair and just opportunity for health and well-being. And as you look at what the drivers are of health and well-being, it's it's not about whether you have a doctor to go to. That, that accounts for about 20% of it. It's critically important. Uh, and the, we, we may touch on the legislation that's being considered in, in, in Washington and uh, uh, I think the dire impact that would have on people's uh, access to, to care. But, but that's about 20%. What it really comes down to are those factors where we live, where we work, where our kids learn and where they play. Um, are we creating communities in a society that makes it easy to be healthy, uh, that makes it easy to get access to, to nutritious food and for uh, us to have physical activity, where it's easy for people to have jobs that pay a living wage so that they're not working three or four for jobs that don't have benefits and give them access to, uh, uh, to, to health care? Um, are we creating those, those, those factors in our society that, that lead to health? And I think we're gonna come around to it uh, as, a, as a nation, as a, as a world, that these are things that everyone should have access to. And we're gonna, we're gonna take that on. Um, we gave out our Culture of Health prizes yesterday and I was in Little County in Central Kansas, Allen County, where this county of 13,000 has decided that they're gonna, they're gonna do what it takes to make their county healthier. Um, they, they were aware that people were leaving their county. There wasn't a, a good reason for people to stay. There wasn't a supermarket. There wasn't a place to be active. And they've taken that on and have decided we're gonna make it better. And those little bright spots around the country give me hope that as a nation, uh, we can do what it takes to, to give everyone that, 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 that sense of, of, of the system works for them. And I, we're basically on the same page, so that's kind of why I had him to start. But my whole thing is about prevention, and I think that the biggest problems that we have are those lifestyle um, conditions, the chronic illnesses like diabetes and hypertension and strokes and behavioral health, and the things that we talk about. They're not sexy, but they're, they're what's there. 
And that's really what we need to address and to, if we're gonna change health in this country. Um, one of the things I'm doing in our clinic, I'm back in my little clinic in Biola Battery, Alabama, but we started a health policy research center. And the reason I started this health policy research center, it's called the Gulf States Health Policy Research Center, is that it, um, it focuses on the five states that border the Gulf of Mexico. And while we have great hospitals, we have great doctors, um, we have even, we do have access to care, but something's keeping our health um, outcomes poor. We have the poorest rankings in the entire country. So it must be something. I suspect that it's health policies. So we're starting to do science and evidence-based research using an NIH grant to start this center to study those things like, um, if you think of my favorite topic, tobacco. In Louisiana, the tobacco tax is about 50 cents a package on cigarettes. In New York, it's $5.50. Those policies matter. And you will see young people are much more sensitive to price. Are there other policies around? We have policies around how many liquor stores are in a community really have outcomes. And so looking at those policies. And so we've given out grants, and we'll have a, a theme issue of a journal coming out. But those are the type of things we need to do. But we're also focusing on the community, having the community participate and say, what is it that we need? And we've got young people and people who've worked in the community all these years, all of a sudden, looking at research and saying, I'm a researcher. As Dr. Francis was saying, people who were afraid of research, afraid of participating, is now interested in, in showing some evidence of what they need. And so that's the sort of thing I think um, we need to focus on in the future. Dr. Jahar? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, any discussion of public health threats um, should be framed by an acknowledgement that public health is, public health programs are under, um, uh, th uh, under threat and are, um, uh, are uh, endangered in a way that they haven't been in, you know, perhaps ever. Uh, Dr. Benjamin and I were talking uh, backstage, and she said, "Well, public health is, programs have never been well funded." Uh, I think that may be true, but the way that the current administration lo is looking at uh, budget cuts for health and human, human services, which are going to uh, affect the U.S. Public Health Service, the CDC, the NIH, and so on, um, it's important to acknowledge that fact and, and see that uh, our responses to public health threats are themselves may be endangered because of the lack of support. Uh, I took uh, your question sort of literally, which is, you know, what are the couple of public health threats that uh, that I see are important in the in the coming decades? Um, so for me, uh, uh, they affect uh, uh, sort of the, the two most important organs in the body: the brain and the heart. I'm a cardiologist, so okay. So so I think the dementia epidemic. Is has to be uh, uh, acknowledged as a major threat. Uh, you know, today we have uh, over five million Americans suffering from Alzheimer's, which is only one form of dementia. And in the coming three decades or so, uh, that number is sure to triple. And unlike uh, other sort of public health uh, problems. Um, uh, chronic illnesses like heart disease and, and cancer, for example, where there have been great successes, uh, dementia really has no treatment. Um, compounding that problem is the fact that there is a huge uh, unpaid caregiver workforce in this country that is getting increasingly fatigued by caring for um, you know, patients, family members who have dementia. Uh, uh, current estimates are about 15 million uh, Americans are, are caring for um, family members without being paid. The, the, the toll in, in, in sort of their own mental health, physical health, as well as in lost uh, wages, job productivity is astounding. So I think that's something that needs to be acknowledged. And there are very, very little the states are doing about it. New York State has a sort of pilot program that's um, uh, that's funding a, uh, a project that will 
um, provide sort of su supportive counseling and in some cases subsidize um, the hiring of help uh, to relieve some of the stresses on these caregivers. But um, that's one state program, I and mean, we need to do a lot more. Doctors need to do a lot more to you know, actually inquire of family members, are you capable of taking care of your loved one? Um, I mean, as a physician, I myself don't really think about it, but when um, a niece or a son or daughter uh, you know, accompanies their, their parent um, to, uh, to a doctor's visit, I think we just assume that they're gonna be available at home. I don't think we can make that assumption. The other big issue I, I see as a cardiologist is, um, is heart disease. And now some of you might say, wait, heart disease, that's old news. Well, um, or you might say, well, heart disease, that's a huge public health success, right? Um, and in some ways, it was and, and is. Um, in, uh, after World War II, one out of two Americans were dying of heart disease. And then due to massive public health efforts like smoking, programs, um, uh, uh, stopping uh, the advertising of cigarettes, um, as well as huge medical advances like the heart-lung machine and, and uh, drugs, uh, the mortality for heart disease dropped dramatically from 1960 to about 2000, dropped by 60%. But there's very good data suggesting that, that those levels are leveling off and, uh, and may be on the uptick. Um, uh, for a combination of reasons, increases in diabetes, leveling off of smoking um, uh, rates, uh, uh, obesity, sedentary lifestyles, and so on. So, um, so I think that uh, heart disease is still the number one killer in this country, and uh, over half a million Americans die of it every year. So I think that's something that, that we have to acknowledge. So I have to ch jump in and mention about the leveling off of smoking. Can't be a surgeon general and not catch on the smoking part. But young people are really at risk, and sometimes we forget that, that they, even though we see the leveling off, they're being targeted. 90% um, of all smokers start before the age of 18 and 99% before the age of 29. And every day, 1,200 people are, um, die from cigarette smoking in this country. And each one of those deaths is being replaced by two young smokers. We call them replacement smokers. So I don't want us to um, get lulled in a false um, level of, of comfort in saying what's leveling off, but young people are at risk. And there's a lot of variation by state. Yes. You know, some, some states are very open to those, those taxes, as you were mentioning, and others not. And some states are open to cities experimenting with more aggressive policy approaches. And then other states uh, practice something called preemption, where the state says that uh, cities within our state are not allowed to, to do those kinds of activities. So and it leads to heart disease, of course. Yeah. 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 But you know, when you think about these messages, um, I think the average person might say, OK, we know smoking, bad, heart disease, bad. It's difficult if you're dealing with chronic disease to come with a new message and deliver that urgency. I mean, what, what do you see as some ways to get around that, to get people to really listen and, and, and pay attention? Because they've heard this message again and again. And um, I just wanted to follow up on something you said, Dr. Jahar, about heart disease. I think it's kind of interesting that Tom Frieden, when he left the CDC, the thing that he started was to focus on what he thought were the two biggest killers in the world, and one is cardiovascular disease, and one is fighting epidemics. And, yeah, you know. yeah I, I think often, often we put too much of the focus on, on personal behavior. And, and say, well, you know, people just wouldn't, would, 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 would do the healthy thing. And there's not as enough appreciation that the choices people make depend on the choices they have. And if you're in a community in a setting where the, the healthy eating really isn't a choice and the streets aren't safe to go out and, and play and there aren't parks uh, and, and the schools aren't providing uh, the, the healthy choice, um, it's not, it's not quite fair to say, well, if, if people would just do the healthy thing. And if populations are being targeted with marketing of, of things that are unhealthy, uh, it doesn't really come down to that sense of it's just a matter of, of, of personal choice. So I don't think after eight years of, of talking to the public through a camera at ABC, um, I don't think it's, it's just about finding that right message. 
Uh, a lot of the work that you know, Tom Frieden did in New York was putting in policies that kind of took it away from personal choice and, 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 and put in policies that, that kind of forced, forced behavior in certain directions. But the patients I, that I see do want to do better. They want their children to be healthier. They want their families to be healthier. Yeah. So we have to make it easier for them. It's very difficult to eat healthy and live healthy when you're saying you've got to take care of you know, your, your kids and then come home and be a caregiver for your, your uh, parents or your grandparents and all the things, most people are now doing two jobs at one time, just trying to keep their ab above water, and yet we're saying, okay, you need to go ahead and just eat healthy. Well, it's not that easy. Right. So w we as policymakers really should be trying to make it easier for them, make, take some of those barriers away and do whatever we can. One of the things that I got in, um, not really hot water, got conversation about was when we tried to offer a healthy, um, a competition for healthy, or not healthy, but most exercise friendly hairstyles, that I thought that was a way to take a barrier away from people who were trying to exercise. We got a lot of flack over it, but that's important when you're trying to go, go and work out. You know, you gotta get back to work. So anything we can do to make it healthier, easier to be healthy. I also, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, what you're saying, which I totally agree with, is that, that chronic disease, heart disease, uh, but really, all chronic diseases are are social and political. Yes, they're they're not just yeah. biological. And ironically, this idea of biological disease, uh, sort of biological mechanisms, for example, for heart disease, was advanced by the U.S. Public Health Service. So by funding uh, a, uh, a a study called the Framingham Study, um, which really tried to take sort of the psychological component out of heart disease and really focus on you know, measurable metrics like diabetes and hypertension or whatever. Um, and that sort of advanced this idea that, that, that heart disease is driven by these biological factors. But uh, you know, as Dr. Besser pointed out, these biological factors have so many social underpinnings. Um, uh, hypertension, for example, is seen more in, in poor communities. We know that poverty and racism and perhaps even income inequality drives hypertension in, in, in communities. So, um, so we're gonna have to attack the, the roots of this problem, not just the, the, the uh, sort of end product. One way we can make some of that a little, a little easier, as I was saying, trying to make it easier, the previous panel, earlier panel, talked about technology, and I think technology may offer us some opportunities to make some of this a little bit easier. I just joined a, a, a newly on a board of a, a digital health company, and um, the reason I joined it is because it may transform the way we can, patients like mine can, can take care of themselves. It's a little, um, it's a, as small as, I guess, the tip of a pencil, but it is a chip that goes into medications. It's a company called Proteus, and it's, uh, it's been in the media. So it's, um, the chip goes into a capsule, and it monitors when you take the pill, whether you took it or not. Mm. And it also monitors some of your heart rate, so, or a heart uh, effects are around it, so you can measure them on your, your digital phone or, or iPhone or whatever. And that way, you know if you took it, you know if it's responding. You know, child that's a kidney transplant or something knows whether they can play a sport or not. A person, uh, I want to make sure that people who don't have insurance, who the, pe the people I see in my clinic can also have ex um, access to that kind of technology that is available for everyone. But it may change the way we're able to personalize health care. Yeah, that, that, that last point. point you made I, I think is, is critically important because I hear so many tech panels and one of the worries I have from a lot of it is that tech will increase disparities. Uh, that it's tech, tech for the haves, not for the have-nots. Yeah. And you know, I want to I want to see efforts to to spur technology to look at how do we use technology to to address the health issues for the most vulnerable members of society and and to to close some of those gaps, because as you know, as we're reading articles about the goal to live to 120, well. I think as a society, there are a lot 
of other things we could be investing our tech dollars in apart from living to 100. I mean, 120 is great, but. Uh, Especially if you're 119. <laughs> if you're 119. But you know, what about making sure that everyone in America can live a high quality life? And for a lot of people, they're not, thinking, they're not worried about 120. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think the impact of technology is potentially uh, revolutionary, not just on patients, but also on caregivers. I, I, I wrote a piece recently about a gadget that one can use to, um, that sort of uh, stores the, the, the muscle tremors of a Parkinson's patient. You can wear the gadget and experience the tremors of your loved one. Uh, now that is hugely important, um, potentially important, because um, you know, as I, as I said, there's a lot of caregiver fatigue in this country because there's so much chronic disease. If we can um, you know, invent gadgets that allow you to experience what diabetic uh, nerve disease is or muscle fasciculations in a Parkinson's patient or um, you know, will improve empathy and improve care. Generally. And to translate this to an international level, these same chronic diseases are the same things in other countries. And it's the UN had its second what um, conference on health was the non-communicable diseases, which was heart disease, diabetes, hypertension. And it's starting to affect the budgets of many countries right now. Yeah. Well, I was wondering if I could jump in here and ask you folks to think about in this context of what you're talking about, sort of looming over this discussion of health, chronic disease, et cetera, is the basic access to care, yeah. right? That all goes out the window if you can't get access to care. And um, if you wanted to spend a few minutes talking about um, the threat that's posed by this latest bill in Congress, and if that passes and becomes the law of the land, um, what that would do to efforts to improve public health. The patients that I see, um, I always describe them as um, too um, poor to afford medical care, but too rich to qualify for Medicaid. And so these are the working people who are paying for things. It's very difficult um, for them as it is. And, and the healthcare legislation that we're discussing would be very, make it very hard. Um, however, we've always taken care of patients. We will always take care of them. We won't let somebody sit on the, lay on the floor and die. But it's much easier when there is resources there and we can do a better job. And so I just hope that we as a society will understand how, how these people live every day, like how all of us live every day, not knowing whether or not we'll be able to get care or whether or not my child can. It's, it's gotten to the point that it's so political that you forget there are real people there. There are actually people one-on-one -on -one who have an, a real life experience with every policy that we're making and every decision that we're making. So I think um, the access to care really does matter. I've seen over the last couple of years just how much has been improved just in the last five years. And so I just hope we don't go backwards. Yeah, I, I, you know, at the, at the foundation, one of the areas that we're very focused on is access to care. We, we believe that everyone in America should have access to high quality, affordable, comprehensive health care, that people with, with pre-existing medical conditions shouldn't have to pay more. Uh, that's, that's part of, of, of our concern over this bill. The other has to do with, with Medicaid. And I, I think there's a misconception in, in Medicaid that Medicaid is, is just something for poor people. Um, Medicaid, yes, almost, I'm a pediatrician and almost half of all children uh, receive uh, care through Medicaid, but Medicaid also pays for 60% of elderly people in nursing homes. Uh, Medicaid provides for, for people who have disabilities. And the idea that, that um, it could vary greatly by state in terms of how those dollars are allocated is very concerning. And that states could decide that, well, people who have Asthma may have to pay a little more for medical conditions. A child with a birth defect may, may, may charge, pay more. Uh, there may be lifelong uh, caps. Um, we don't know uh, because it takes away this guarantee across the nation that everyone should have access to essential health services 
Um, yeah, anyone who's, who's, who's sick and dying who comes in is going to be cared for, but that's not what it's about. It's about prevention. It's about having a doctor, or having a health system that works for you and your family, and not having to worry, not saying, well, we're not going to get those teeth fixed uh, because we can't afford it. I mean, it's, it's all of this stuff, and this, it looks like this bill is just slipping through. And it's, and, it's and very in Alabama, concerning. You know, in Alabama today, if you make over $250 a month, you make too much to qualify for Medicaid. And we talk about Medicaid as though it's, you know, it's for these rich, lazy people. It's not. Yeah, no, I, I, the, um, you know, I, when you talk about this bill, I mean, I think the first thing that, that we have to come to some consensus on, and, and shockingly, there is there's still debate about this, is that access to care results in tangible health benefits. That it, it results in, um, uh, in, in, in longer lives. There's still debate about this. Um, that I think is largely politically driven. Um, there was a, a piece uh, that Gawande had in the New England Journal um, recently that, that sort of um, you know, uh, really frames the debate, I think, well, and, and essentially shows that, that having access to care helps you live longer, helps you deal with health problems better. It prevents bankruptcies, and, and so, um, this bill is, is worrisome. I, I, I'm not a health policy expert, but um, Sarah Cliff had a nice piece in Vox recently um, where she basically s says that this Graham-Cassidy bill is the most radical uh, repeal and replace uh, bill that the Republicans have put forth for uh, Obamacare. Uh, not only will it uh, get rid of the individual mandate, um, cut Medicaid, uh, get rid of marketplace subsidies. Uh, the current sort of guess is that 32 million Americans will go uninsured, uh, you know, in the coming years. I think uh, by 2026. That's 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 awful. You know, we were we were very encouraged by some of the bipartisan efforts. You know, the idea that both parties could come together and and try and improve on the Affordable Care Act is 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 I think something that makes sense and that, that the American people would like to, like to see happen. You know, again, being out in rural Kansas, they're really worried about rural hospitals being able to survive if there are cuts to, cuts to Medicaid. I mean, you must see that, you see that greatly. Every day, every day. And, and it's stressful, it adds stress to the community um, when you talk about the things that better health. Better health allows people to, kids to be better prepared to go to school, they're, they're learn better. Elderly people can stay in their homes longer. Um, the workforce is healthier. If we want to bring work and economic opportunities. You need a healthy workforce. And how do you do that without a healthy society? I had one last question for you all sort of out of left field, which is you're all scientists. You all do your work based on evidence-based medicine. There are many people out there who go to the doctor or come to you and um, say, well, I don't believe what you're saying because this website of this celebrity says don't get vaccinated or don't take this. And uh, because of the internet and the speed at which news like that travels, I was wondering in terms of providing care and, and for the greater good of public health, how big of, of an issue is that becoming? It's a big issue. I think we have to speak to people in a way that they understand it, in a conversation where they understand. We throw a lot of information. We're always telling people what you can't do. You can't eat this. You can't do that. You can't do this. Why don't we start telling them what they can do and how they can be healthier and make it um, more positive? Because you get tired of hearing how negative things are and being more positive, but also just, just breaking it down into very everyday conversation that, that the everyday person can understand. The other thing is that um, there is a lot of misinformation out, and when someone is, is set in their ways, um, you, you sometimes can't change their minds, and, and we have to accept that, and um, we have a little saying, you can't argue with stupidity. You know, some things like um, vaccinations and some things you just can't, you just move on and try to educate the rest of the people who are willing to learn. Yeah, I, I think this is a really critical issue. Um, and the, the question of who are the trusted voices in society and how, how do we ensure that as, as healthcare professionals 
uh, we, we remain or regain that, that trust. It's one of the things we talk about a lot. How do we be a, a, a trusted nonpartisan voice? Not, not a, a voice yelling across the divide, but one looking to bridge that divide with facts, with science, with, with, with reason. And uh, I'm not sure how we do it. I know media is, is very concerned about this as well, but it's, it's a big yeah. issue. I think medicine also, doctors need to take some responsibility for the fact that our patients are going to these you know these these alternate alternative websites where which are very often populated by quacks uh, you know I mean so you have you know people going to well you know Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow's goop uh, and and uh, sort of adopting these potentially dangerous uh, things like you know vaginal steaming and jade eggs and all that I mean why are they seeking that um, it, it, you know maybe we need to do a better job with our patients, spend a little more time with them, communicate uh, you know, what really is sort of evidence-based. And finally, I would just say that I think education is so important. Um, well, most people don't link it with healthcare. It is so important to have an educated society. We are dumbing down our, our entire um, masses. And if you don't understand basics, it's hard to, to communicate. And you can't participate in a, in a democracy if you don't understand it. And so I think we need to put more resources into educating our K-12. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to have to wrap up. That's all the time we have for today. I want to thank all my panelists, Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Besser, and Dr. Jahar, for being here with us today and for this great conversation. I'd like to hand things off to my colleague, Sally Quinn, who will be interviewing Dr. Deepak Chopra. Thank you very much. Thank you.